Take time to read our free eye-opening booklet, What Science Will Never Discover About Your Mind. In the last episode of this series, I told you my favorite quote from Charles Darwin, but I only gave you a partial quote. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little, not those who know much, who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. And also request another, does God exist? I can save you the time, no. There is no reason anyone should believe in a God and plenty of good reasons not to. But while we're peddling books, my own will be out from Pitchstone Publishing in September. Just like this video series, my book also exposes the foundational falsehoods of creationism, disproving every category of the cretinous and already disputed arguments you've repeated here. Stop and think of all the works of nature around you, on earth and in the heavens. First, consider the many kinds of planets, stars, and galaxies. Each is its own marvel. Yeah, about that. If your God created the universe just for us, then why didn't he give us a bigger playing field? Why is it that we can only exist on a minor portion of the surface of this one mote of dust out of the whole of an incomprehensibly vast cosmos? Let me better illustrate that. Imagine that the whole world was created just for this fish. He believes in the magic carp, a giant invisible fish that spoke the world into being. Yeah, I know fish can't speak, but then neither can snakes or donkeys. And complex systems can't be conjured by incantations either, but we're not talking about the Bible right now. The point I'm trying to make is the absurdity of this fish believing that the whole world was created just for him, yet he can never leave the confines of this tiny bowl. What a fantastically wasteful creation that is. And we're in the same situation. Billions of us clinging to a rock that is only 8,000 miles across, restricted from everything else, anywhere else, because everything is out of reach and so far all of it is inhospitable. This is consistent with the unintentional process of evolution, but we really should expect more from a god. Especially when your sacred fables say that the earth was the first thing ever created and that it took God five days just to make this one rock. Yet he sneezed out the rest of the entirety of the universe all at once, four days into constructing this one world. What about the other ones? This is Miranda, one of several moons of Uranus. It is a tiny globe, only about the size of Sri Lanka, yet it orbits a world many times bigger than ours. Look at the strange shape on the surface known as the chevron. How did that happen? We have no idea. There are no tectonics or weather on this tiny ball of dirt, so no erosion either. This could have happened a billion years ago for all we know. Hundreds of millions of years before we existed, and it could still be there hundreds of millions of years after we're gone. Just like everything else there is, and the point of that is that this had nothing to do with us. This is Triton, the largest moon of Neptune. And what happened here? It looks like it was scorched on one side. Pretty impressive for the coldest world yet measured. But whatever catastrophe caused this, it too had nothing to do with us. And these are just the worlds that, in one system. Imagine the histories and complexities of the zillions of other worlds that will forever be beyond our range. Neither our planet nor our sun have any sort of significance on the cosmic scale. There are many other suns. There are, stars, rather, that are bigger than our own sun, even though the Bible says that the stars are all smaller than our sun and that they're held in the expanse of a crystalline firmament, which we know does not exist. And there's over a hundred billion other suns in the galaxy, and there's trillions more galaxies than that. Yet the Bible doesn't know about any of that because it was written from the geocentrist perspective of mere fallible primitives who didn't have telescopes and who demonstrated that they had no understanding of the true nature of the cosmos or our pitiful planet's pathetic part in it. Second, consider all species of plants on Earth. There are millions diverse in color, shape, size, beauty, and length of life. I've spent much of my life studying and working with many kinds of plants. The brilliance of their varying designs and purposes never ceases to amaze me. And yet, you have no idea how plants are classified in a taxonomic hierarchy of daughter groups within ancestral parent groups. How could you spend much of your life studying plants and still have no idea how one species is related to another, or which species are more closely related than another? And those designs that you talked about, they're not intended, they're incidental, and their purpose is determined only by those who use them. A side note should be considered. 
All existing food on Earth is perfectly designed for human or animal consumption. It is constructed to contain just the right amounts of differing elements necessary to sustain various life forms. I'm Ewell Gibbons. Many consider me an expert on natural foods like cattails. Yes, they're edible. You seem to be using the word food interchangeably with the word plant. In which case, look at eucalyptus. They're highly toxic. Koalas have developed a chemical resistance to them and are now addicted, uh, entirely dependent on them. It's hard to know what is food and what isn't. This mushroom is good for frying and this one will fry your mind, while this one will just kill you. Why? Do you think it's because they all have just the right amounts of different elements to sustain you? Are you sure about that? And not all food is vegan either. This is fugu. If you think it contains just the right amounts of different elements to sustain life, catch one, clean it, cook it, and eat it yourself. I'll watch. Every time man tries to improve or alters food, he pollutes, ruins, devitalizes, injects with poison, genetically re-engineers, or in some manner reduces its perfection into something inferior to what he started with. Every time, huh? Without exception? Just look at the foods you show in your own slides. Do you think this is what we started with? No. We've altered or modified all of that. For example, when we, before we started using artificial selection and hybridization to genetically engineer peaches, they look like this. And when we first got a hold of oranges, they look like this. But after we cultivated them to derive and blend our favorite strains, taking advantage of new mutations, we end up with this. It tastes much better and is better to eat than the original, and this one doesn't even have seeds. It can't reproduce without our help. Now you have slides of seedless watermelons, but look how watermelons started out. That's not like any watermelon you've probably seen, but that's because you're eating a agriculturally cultivated strain of the original thing. Same with bananas. People have been cultivating bananas for a thousand years, and yet there are a few different types. When they're ripe, they're either brown, yellow, red, purple, or they always stay green. The original food banana is a green Asian plantain, which is crammed full of large, hard seeds amid a hardcore matrix that is virtually inedible unless softened by cooking. There's another more common wild-type banana that has noxious seeds and is so rigid inside that you still can't chew it and wouldn't want to, even if it was cooked. And this soft-tissued cultivar is from a mutant strain which first appeared in Jamaica in 1836. Since then, many other cultivars have been developed from them so that we now have these five-sided seedless varieties. That's how evolution works in agriculture. If mankind would just leave food alone and eat it as God created, sickness, disease, and every form of nutrition-related infirmity would disappear. You think God created carrots like this? These were genetically modified from this. This is the wild type from which carrots were derived. You think if people were still eating those, that no one would have any dietary issues anymore? Are you stupid? Or do you just not care if any of the things you say are true? Because everything you've said so far is wrong. And the first problem here is that you're telling people not to cook their food, and that includes baking bread. Remember, some things like corn and beans have to be cooked because they're so perfect that we can't even eat them otherwise. You're also telling people not to use any means of preservative, which includes salting, drying, and pickling. The thing is, when you've got a population of billions of people and they can't all farm their own food because that would take up all their time and they, many of them have other important things to do, then we collectively rely on agricultural sciences. Farmers selecting the best genes for the new crop and how to keep that food from rotting from the truck to your table. For example, we didn't just find corn and learn how to grow it as we found it. We made it ourselves out of grass. There's a series of genetic tests and hybridization experiments done to confirm that corn was derived from a type of bushy grass called teosinte. Roughly 10,000 years ago, Mesoamerican farmers sorted their seeds and only planted the ones that were most like what they wanted. They chose the ones that grew the best and were the most robust and had the longest cobs with the lar largest and most edible and best tasting kernels and so on. These variations were favored over others, and that led to a series of maize, and this selective process eventually produced modern sweet corn as it is known and marketed today. 
the germination, growth, development, and maturation of plants into the many kinds of food available just to human beings represents its own series of miracles far too complex to recount here. It would command its own book just to explore beyond the most superficial overview. And yet, for all your big talk, at the end of that volume, you still would not have confirmed a single miracle, nor could you have addressed any of the botanical facts as well or as in-depth as evolution has already explained it, nor could you refute any of that. It also reminds me of how much must have sucked for primitive nomads to happen across unfamiliar herbs and fungus, to have to choose someone to taste these things to see if they're edible, and then whether they're poisonous, because you don't know that until after you've eaten it. Kind of exactly what you would expect it to be if life evolved without a god. Now think hard. Who is more intelligent? God, who made perfect food, or men, who find every possible way to alter and degrade it before consuming it? Well, I admit that not everything they've altered has been improved. The reason that they do it is because they have made substantial improvements. Meet Norman Borlaug. He cultivated an unnatural hybrid of wheat and rye, one that had to be chemically treated just to be able to reproduce. But it meant a high-produce wheat that could withstand much worse conditions than natural wheat could. And Borlaug planted this artificial wheat in third world countries around the world and trained people how to raise and harvest it in places where normal wheat wouldn't grow. He is now known as the man who saved a billion people, the one individual credited with having saved more lives than anyone else in history, and he did it with GMOs improving imperfect food. So don't ask me about your god's intelligence, because according to your own mythology, your god is not all that bright. Excusing the failed prophecy in Genesis 18, which is especially embarrassing since it was written after the fact, Abraham should not have been able to barter God down like he did. And clearly, your God hadn't created his own omniscience yet. He couldn't even outsmart Abraham, a character who would qualify as insane if any of this were real. Third, consider the over one million different kinds of animals, plus the estimated 12 million kinds of insects. I've heard estimates that there are 12 million species of insects, although that estimate is less than half of the other end of that range. It seems that when you say kinds, you're really talking about species, and that'll be important in a later video in the series. For the moment, I should just point out that insects are animals too. An animal is defined as any organism consisting of multiple diploid eukaryotic cells whose gametes have a posterior flagella, and most importantly, which must ingest other organisms in a digestive tract in order to survive. And this definition includes insects, and it includes people, too. Like plants, as well as fungus and other living things, animals like us are classified in a taxonomic hierarchy of descendant daughter groups nested within a series of ancestral parent groups. And again, this only makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. Carolus Linnaeus, who first designed this classification in the 1700s, was a pre-Darwinian creationist, and he couldn't begin to make sense of the taxonomic divisions that he discovered and that only evolution could explain. Now, plants are able to produce their own food, but according to your story, God didn't want us to have that ability. He wanted to make sure that we had to kill living cells in order to fuel our already imperfect dependent bodies. And obviously, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the fruit of the tree of eternal life are both parables intended to refer to the results of our choices. And every other time that that appears in the Bible, that's exactly what that means. But in this one instance, you think it actually happened. So I have to ask, given that Adam had a chance to eat from the fruit of eternal life, what would have happened if he hadn't eaten from either tree? Because these creatures are animate, they are even more marvelous and fascinating than our plants. But their diversity in color, shape, size, beauty, and lifespan is much like plants. And why do you think that is? Could it be that we share half our DNA with them? Are they not eukaryotes whose cells are infested with symbiotic bacteria just as ours are? Just as in any other field of science, there are laws specific to evolution which evolution also has to follow. And I made a video listing these. The point is that everything that exists confirms to these laws, and not one created being does. Every sort of animal or plant that men have ever made up for movies or mythology or whatever all violate taxonomy, every single one of them, because a creator can put feathered wings onto monkeys if he wants to, or put a brain inside a plant, but evolution can't do any of that. 
So it is important to note that there is not one species anywhere which implies a magical creator rather than an evolutionary ancestor. And both plants and animals, as well as fungus and other things, are all in that taxonomic tree together. The point? As fascinating, marvelous, beautiful, and amazing as are all the things described here, nothing is as amazing as the human mind. It is the absolute pinnacle of all living organisms. None can doubt this. I've learned to doubt everything you say. For the moment, it is fair to say that the human mind is the most developed in the animal kingdom, largely because of the physical advantages we have over, say, dolphins. The dolphin brain is probably just as capable as ours, but not in that body. They have no hands, and they live in an environment where it is impossible to use hands, either to make tools or to harness fire. It's really unfortunate for them. Elephants, too, could, probably could develop to our level if they had some means of manipulating objects better than through their nose. It's also helpful if you're a coordinated predator, because that helps build teamwork skills. And there are some really smart birds out there, too, but they have the same problem. So there's really no way these other animals could develop that at the accelerated rate that we did. For another injustice, look at raccoons. They have hands, and they can stand and walk when they have to. They have every advantage to use a large and powerful brain, but they didn't get that. Dolphins did. A group that can never do anything with it. That's why I laugh whenever anyone talks to me about intelligent design. Think of what man has been able to produce. He can build houses, make smartphones, trains, automobiles, planes, rockets, computers, and other sophisticated devices that are almost limitless in complexity and usefulness. Yet man's creative genius has a limit. No man or group of men can create anything as marvelous as the human mind. Everything man creates is inferior to his own mind. Try thinking of one thing that has ever been created by men that is superior to the minds who created it. You will fail. Except that we've already created electronic brains that are far better calculators than we could ever be, whose memories don't corrupt and lose or distort information the way ours do, and importantly, where the software is still there exactly as it was, even after it's been turned off indefinitely and turned back on again. And where all the data can be transferred to another unit if need be. Don't you wish we could do any of that with human minds? Also, in the mid-1990s, a graphic artist with a Master of Science from MIT named Carl Sims inspired a line of computer programs designed to evolve virtual creatures. His and subsequent programs encoded various evolutionary rules into a population-based metaheuristic optimization algorithm for a simulated application of mutations against natural selection. This worked with an artificial neural network of virtual sensors and virtual muscles connecting the cuboid limbs of his virtual creatures. The whole system was designed to solve functional problems in a 3D world of simulated physics, graphics, and friction. There was even an objective to access and control a particular cube generating competition. Different lines of descendant designs were optimized automatically, purely through preferential selection of the more functional variants according to the rules of population genetics and without any prior assumptions of fitness. They also eliminated any influence or bias or desire and let the computers calculate this purely on their own, only according to the rules imposed on evolution. Even without an end goal, once simple rules are laid out, simulated life forms will effectively design themselves through an unconscious practice of trial and error over several successive generations. They'll even refine and improve those designs literally without trying because intent was deliberately removed from the equation. This is a demonstration of emergence. It was noted that given a few simple rules that an otherwise thoughtless system, process, or algorithm could actually produce emergent complexity beyond the capability of human designers. Here is the question. Who or what created your mind and you? I guess I created my own mind since it developed within the organism known as me. The organism that I am was created as a genetic recombination of my parents' DNA, and the type of organism that I am was determined by my lineage within evolving primates. Now, you might imagine some other magical aspect to add to that, but you have no evidence to back your assertion, and it requires that we deny what we can already show to be true. King David stated, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Surely this is most true of the human brain. Wonderfully? Sure. Fearfully? No. I don't get my biology from storybooks. 
And there's a lot of myths I can quote from even older books saying much the same thing but attributed to different gods. However, these are all just products of the imaginations of men. Others have written extensively about how our evolution actually produces notions of religious nonsense, but I'm not going to unpack all of that right now. Be honest. Can you possibly believe some kind of blind, dumb power or force of no intelligence way below that of men created your mind? More than that, we now have several means by which I can prove it. Were this a two-way conversation, I would, but it would mean that there would be a lot of verifiable facts you'd have to learn and a lot of nonsensical bullshit you'd have to unlearn. Remember, you can create nothing superior to your mind, so only a greater mind could create your mind. Well then, who created the greater mind? We know that emergence can produce astounding complexity with a system running on very few rules, and that this solves the problem from the bottom up. However, your top-down reinterpretation of that demands an infinite regress. And we're not just talking about the obvious thing, either. There is much more wrong with your notion than just the infinite identities of the super-gods who created the lesser gods who created you. Don't insult yourself. Don't suggest your extraordinary creative powers of intelligence, reason, logic, thought, volition, and ingenuity are a product of dumb luck. Accepting reality as it is need not be an insult. Evolution has always been a source of fascination for me. I've studied it with interest since I was a little boy. And what I know about it now means that it would be an insult to my intelligence to pretend instead that my ancestors were magically conjured according to any of the obvious myths and fables to which you hold dear. None of that is even possibly true, and you should stop trying to fool people who know better than you.